Okay, so microservices. Damien mentioned that some of the core ideas around the original development of microservices were inspired by and sort of co-developed along with domain-driven design, and that links back to working backwards from your customer. Understand the problem domain and focus on modeling your system to solve things in the problem domain and then actually model your system on that problem domain. So, bounded context. So this is one of the key things that we borrow from DDD in terms of thinking about designing and identifying our services. So it's trying to identify what's the boundary within our problem space, trying to identify what's important here versus something that's similar but different and I want, don't want to worry about over there. So it's this idea of having this scope that I'm working within and that scope is where we have a set of rules and terminology that is all consistent and when we start moving into other parts of the customer domain they start treating things a bit differently and so we don't want to have that as part of our context that's someone else's problem to deal with and so we get this idea of we can break a scenario or a environment up into different domains and so for a simple example we could have our sales context and our support context and so within sales we've got things like pipelines opportunities sales people territories customers products and then we've got a support side which has tickets and defects and versions and customers and products and this is where we start thinking of the reason we call these two different domains is they think of customers and products differently in support versus sales and so there's going to be some information about a customer that support people need to know that salespeople don't want to know about. Similarly, there's things salespeople know about customers that support don't need to know about. And so this is where we say that there's going to be a link between those domains, because at some stage when we sell something to a customer and the customer reports something or wants support for something, we want to bridge that link and say, oh, well, yes, that is really one of our customers but we're going to have different models for the customers between those two domains. Similarly, we'll have different models for the products between those two domains. And so they'll be separate entities. There will be a sales customer, there'll be a support customer. Oh, and sort of ugly diagrams. So our microservices. <clears throat> So what we want to be looking at is this idea that we have these separate services. And within that, some of the things that we wanted to get across about microservices was, okay, I've got a bunch of logic happening inside of it. So I've got my software design for my each service and each service has its own database. And so key thing we're looking for here is the services are independent of each other. Now that means we're going to be duplicating stuff. So downside of microservices is we duplicate stuff. The upside of that is because we've now got duplicates that I can scale things much easier. I don't have one universal database that has to somehow manage the load across all my services. Oh, I don't have one universal database that has to have a model of everything for every service. And so that idea that, oh, I have different views of some similar entities. So my sales service and my support service can each have their customer and product representations in the database. And I don't have to have one big database that says, oh, here is a customer. When you load the customer, you filter out things and ignore them, or you load a customer and you create this massive customer object in your thing, and then there's just a bunch of stuff and services and data and methods that you just don't want to know about. Which means that we're trying to avoid coupling between our different services so that we're not 
introducing coupling between services by sharing data across them or reusing classes across them. So introduces duplication, oh, but that again comes back to our two pizza team. Oh, that makes it easier for two pizza teams, small teams to actually work independently because they just build some things for their software and get their software to work. They don't have to say, oh, I need to update customer. I now need to talk to every other team that works with customers to say, I need to make this change and will it work? No, I just update customer, it works for me. They have their own customer. So every service is independent and we have then this API layer, which is the, oh, we have these APIs. How do I talk to my services? Whatever mechanism you want to do that for that, and then I have my user interface that uses those APIs to use those services. Um, there's various options for designing of the user interfaces. They can be independent user interfaces that use subsets of services. So if we go back to, oh, our running example is Sahara, as the opposite of Amazon. <laughs> um, so our Sahara example, is we had a customer ordering interface and we had then a <coughs> inventory maintenance in interface. And so you'd have two separate interfaces using some shared and some different services to implement their behavior. Or maybe there's one big monolithic user interface, which actually you don't want to have a really big system to do this because it's going to be big and ugly. But for a smallish system, you may have a single user interface and then there'll be user interface components internally that work with other user interface components that talk to the API layer. So two principles <clears throat> we want to deal with in terms of microservices. So first is every service is a cohesive entity. And so it's delivering a business process. So every service relates to a particular bounded context. And the other key principle is independence. Services are independent of each other or there is minimal coupling between services. So one service should not worry about and need to know about the implementation of another service. So, as I said, we want low coupling. That to enable a very large system to be built, I need to have minimal coupling between the parts because a very large system has to be built by a very large set of people and back to the people problem thing. If I've got a large group of people who have to coordinate, it won't happen. Not so much because people can't cooperate with each other, it's just there's too much interaction, too much coordination, too much communication um, to enable this to happen. And We've been involved in medium-sized monolithic projects where just the communication started overwhelming the development. That, oh, I need to talk to you, and then you, and then you, and then I need to actually write some code, and now that I made this change, I have to go back and talk to all those other people because I didn't actually have the right idea in the first place. Minimal coupling which then leads to no reuse. If I don't reuse stuff, I'm not depending on someone else's implementation, and then I don't have these dependencies where if I need to make a change, that it's going to screw up other teams. And then a couple of comments. So, in some well, in a lot of references, when they start talking about microservices, say, oh, you've got all these services. Oh, they've got to work together to deliver a system. How do you get that to happen? Um, and so sometimes they talk about using choreography and orchestra 
for orchestration as mechanisms to get your services to work together. And so we talked about, quite a while ago, event-driven systems and the idea of a broker and a mediator as two approaches, where the broker is your simpler approach of, I have this broker that receives messages and basically just does the, okay, here's a message, who is interested in it, manages the publish subscribe process, the mediator which then actually has more internal logic and coordinates the actual process. So an example of that mediator type approach for microservices is that I want to have some service that does something and it uses a bunch of other services to do that. And so I've got this API, API layer and so I want to order a book, which is very appropriate given an Amazon lecture. <laughs> this wasn't organized that way, but we want to order a book. So you've got an order placement service, which means that, okay, you're ordering, so it's going to talk to payment to say you need to pay for the order, and it's going to talk to inventory to update the order, which is okay, I've got these services and I've got this mediator that manages it. And as it gets more complicated, we can do more of the orchestration, and so I've got place order, and so again, we've got a have an order placement thing, an inventory thing, and a payment thing. So the real difference between this is just, oh, that I'm taking the process here and the process of order, play, order placement is managed within order placement. Here we're separating out the process and I've got a place order process and order placement and inventory and a play, payment that are all connected together. And what I'm going to say is, don't do either of these. <clears throat> because I've now got services talking to each other, I've just broken my coupling rules. This is horrible, despite the fact this is a common description in many references. And, and in, real, well, in reality is, I was going to make the comment of, in 2017, Uber had 1,400 services to deliver their functionality because they were doing these things. They had a bunch of services to do stuff and then they had a bunch of services to coordinate doing stuff and then those got complicated so they had a bunch of services to coordinating the services that were coordinating the services to do stuff. That was getting a bit, well, yes, far too complicated. So you then end up with really that often you'll end up with this hierarchy of services where all the lower level services now are reasonably independent but everything above them depends on all the implementations of the services below them and depends on their APIs so all those lower level services can't really be changed without screwing up the entire system and so how you solve it is you introduce a new service to solve the problem rather than, so you just make it more complicated. Don't do this. So how bad is it? Very bad. Instead, oh, we were just talking about messaging services. Have a messaging service. So we don't interconnect our services. Services generate events in that microservices that I've seen where there has been real potential for long-term extension have been the services are fairly independent. Services generate events. Events go into some messaging service and then I've got listeners. I can listen for events and then services coordinate their behavior based on the events. Oh, and you just heard a whole lecture on this is a great idea. Oh, and some of the problems of that. that. Oh, now people generate a bunch of events which don't necessarily always tell me the information I need. 
and they're all in different formats. So there are difficulties here. The larger your system gets, the more that you're going to have events that have different schemas, different formats, not necessarily the information you need, and sometimes you've got to collect a couple of events to actually build up information, or you've got to negotiate with teams to give me the information I want in an event. Life is never perfect, but we can provide much better separation by using a messaging service. Oh, this really horrible diagram. <laughs> so this is actually breaking up Sahara into a microservices architecture. So we've seen multiple architectures for Sahara. Web store is an amazing thing. You can build it so many ways. Okay, so microservices. So we've got, um, so it follows along with our basic structure. We've got mobile and web apps to interact with this thing. So I've got my mobile app for customers. I've got my web pages for customers. I've still got a, um, so this example is actually really old. So we use JSF. So we've got, oh, Apache, Tom, EE running within my services, delivering stuff. Plus I've also got JavaScript running on the browser. So okay, we've got our web application, which is in this case split across the web server and the browser. I've got my mobile app, which is a little more modern. Um, and I've got my inventory application, which are all talking to this API layer. So this API layer, is running on a cloud platform which has got my API interface. So I've got an API interface running up in the cloud platform and then I've got my microservices. Uh, and just to make things fun, we've got stuff running on our own servers. So inventory management and product fulfillment run on our own services, our own servers. They each have their own independent databases. We have the um, account management, product browsing and product purchasing running on AWS, and we've got data mining running on Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, just to make it complicated. And yes, literally it was just to show you, you can divide it up. You don't have to have everything running on one um, type of infrastructure. There's benefits both ways. That only one set of cloud infrastructure means you don't have to learn everyone else's. But it also means I can take advantage of what's customized for different cloud infrastructures if I do split it across and say, ah, well, Oracle I actually do like their data mining services, so I actually am going to spit it off and do it off in Oracle rather than trying to do it in AWS. Yeah, it's got some good stuff. Oracle really has a lot more research behind the themes. To do that, I'll trust them. So let's just divide things up as necessary. And as we see, each service has its own independent databases. Each service is now sending messages to our message queue. So we've got our event queue up here. <clears throat> and we are then saying, OK, when customer is browsing, that we're sending messages up into the message queue saying they visited page X, they've looked at product Y, and that's all being fit into the data mining service. And as they're going through that, we're sending messages to the data mining services saying they've looked at, they've looked at, they've looked at. So data mining service is then coming back with product suggestions to populate on their pages as they browse. Um, and similarly then, We've got our product purchasing, so they've been browsing, they've added items to their cart, and then they need to actually purchase it, so we want to go through the checkout process. It's going to send events, so both saying they have purchased, which goes to the data mining service. Oh, and then purchasing means we have to do our payment through a payment gateway, and we then also need to be sending off messages that are going to be picked up by inventory management and product fulfillment that there's an order placed 
we need to record that order, inventory needs to be updated, fulfillment needs to actually then go through its own process of actually um, picking the items and then delivering the items. So there's our microservices approach to the Sahara example. which I've got browsing, which handles browsing and searching, and product purchasing as two separate services. Are they really separate contexts? Yes. I've got one yes. Why? So there's a focus there. So one way of arguing is that, yeah, there's a different focus, different things as a customer I want to do between browsing and purchasing. So there's an argument of why they're separate contexts. Okay, back from the, yeah, from a customer perspective, oh, those are different things. From a business perspective, I want them to browse to purchase. Okay, argument. I could say, yeah, potentially separate contexts or not. Oh, separate services. If this, if they're separate services, they have, they're not sharing a shopping cart. Browsing, I need to be constantly saying, okay, they've looked at, they've looked at, oh, they've added to their shopping cart, being thrown into a message queue, which means that there's then Purchasing needs to be saying, oh, something's added to a cart. I need to know who added it. I need to store information about a cart. I need to add these things to each customer's cart. They're sharing a lot of data. Oh, I might make them one service. That's a lot of data to be just pushing, which is, well, I'm still going to be sending all that, putting all that data into the message queue because I need to say, oh, they added this to the cart. Daily mining wants to know about that. So I could actually implement them as separate services because this information will be in the message queue, but there is a lot of excess processing going on in purchasing to actually enable to separate them out, which is an argument for potentially I don't want to. Oh, one of the key things here with a store is on my product database. If everyone's got their own database now, hang on. Um, they're gonna have to maintain consistency about products. So every time we add new products, every time we update the number of products, oh, maybe not. Maybe I only want to know about products and browsing Oh, except in real stores, you get the not available, rather than saying, ah, we have this product, I order 20 of them, and then it comes back and says, sorry, we don't have any of these, they'll be available in 20 months. So yeah, you probably do need to be making sure that browsing and searching knows what, well, they need to know what products are actually available, plus what the inventory is, so this is information that's got to be shared between them. It could be, again, through the message queue, could be through other mechanisms. But we've got to manage this idea that there's this consistency of the product database between the ability to browse and purchase and actually manage my inventory, which is going to be painful. Um, So, the advantages of our microservices architecture. So, why we do microservices? Because they're modular, because we separate things out and have small focus services that do one thing from the business perspective. It then gives me a large extensible system because I've got my 
independence of services, so it's easier to add new services and extend functionality for the system. Um, I get reliability from the perspective of I now have all of these independent services that can be running on duplicated environments, and so I get reliability not from the perspective of every service is built to be reliable, but every service is failable. They can fail and recover. And we get interoperability, because I now have a bunch of services that have some communication mechanism, hopefully through some sort of messaging service, which then provides a mechanism for things integrating and talking to each other. And then services are independent, so they're scalable. And so we can then look at mechanisms for scaling up every service, and every service can scale to its own needs, and it's much easier to scale a very large system if you've got small services doing their own thing. Security, nothing unique about microservices. Security is just hard everywhere. Um, deployability. Lots of fun. You've got lots of stuff to deploy. So no, it's not particularly spectacularly deployable, but it's not particularly hard either. Um, testable. There's benefits of their independence, so there's much easier to test things independently. It's end-to-end -end testing that's a little more painful. We're not talking about simplicity here, but we're moving on. Large business systems are going to be large complex systems. Just simplicity is not a possibility anymore. Any questions? <laughs>